Oh, didn't see you there. Welcome to Flip Class. This video is going up on Wednesday night to be watched by Friday morning. And remember, our new unit, we're double flipping double time. So there'll be another video coming out on Monday for you to watch by Wednesday. Keep in mind, it is a video, so you do have the powers to pause and stop and rewind and etc, etc, etc. So, let's begin. We're going to talk about forecasting today. Now, forecasting is really fun. Uh, how you tell what the weather's going to do next. And this is the thing that you primarily watch TV for. So, I'm going to teach you how to do it. You can impress your friends at parties. Now, there's three main types of forecasting. There's a synoptic style of forecasting. That's the old method. There's numerical modeling. This one is awesome. This is what is done right now on a regular basis. And there's also, in addition to that, the statistical forecasting. And that's sort of a blended thing. This one, the statistical, that's the one that's really useful. This is the one that we're mostly going to do, seeing as uh, we don't really have access to the tools for this as much. So let's get into a little more detail. Synoptic forecasting, as you probably guessed, you use a synoptic weather map and you look at what the weather's doing and then you say this is what I think the weather's going to do next. It's basically what we've been doing uh, really all class long. You, you see the weather, you look at what it's doing the night before and say, okay, the next day it's probably going to be like this. You use some of the information you know about what fronts do to help you with that and use some information about you like there's some precipitation. Obviously it's raining there, probably going to rain near. So that's the synoptic weather forecasting method. Again, it's very old. Uh, all the way back to ancient cultures have been doing this. So really, we've got more advanced and we have better techniques now, but there still is some level of validity in synoptic weather map, synoptic style forecasting. And this is where the people come in. So there are several downsides to it. Uh, one, it relies he very heavily on rules of thumb like, oh, I feel it in my bones, it's going to rain, that sort of thing. Uh, it's very unpredictable. It's not really scientifically standardized, and that leads to a lot of problems. In addition to that, it uh, doesn't really take into account a lot of the things that we know about, like what the winds are going to be doing, what the jet stream is going to be doing, etc. Uh, there's no modeling, which uh, everybody loves models, so we should have more modeling. And there's no math. There's no math. And because there's no math, then there's also no fun. So let's talk about numerical forecasting. Here's a great example of numerical forecasting. You can see right here, it says 48 hours. Maybe you can see that. We're looking at the 500 millibar levels. So we're looking at the winds aloft. But we look at winds. We look at information. And you can actually make an estimate of what is going to be happening. Here's another. Uh, here's some stuff about numerical modeling. Uh, you have to have a super computer. The biggest, fastest computers in the world are used for one of two things. One of them is numerical modeling for the weather. The other one is for protein folding for pharmaceutical companies so they can figure out how to make better drugs and stuff. But really, like, like the biggest, best computers in the world, it's on the ballpark of 56,000 computer equivalents, the level of computing power required to model mathematically. Just to give you an idea what that means, that means it is doing the work of 56,000 computers. It's a lot of computers. A whole room full of computers. And actually, OSU has a weather prediction uh, model that runs for Antarctica, and they actually rent out time at Buckeye Supercomputing to use their supercomputers. They use the majority of the computing power there. So it really, it's, it's several billion calculations, the best computers ever. That's what they're doing with this. And when you think about it, you got to remember, you've got pieces of air, uh, parcels are represented by boxes. So every molecule is represented by a box. And then you basically run mathematical calculations on where the box is going to go. And it all is designed to mimic the actual atmosphere. So the more boxes you have, the higher resolution. The higher resolution, the more computing power you have. But it actually is possible to have a box representing every piece of air for the entire world. Think about our global wind circulation. Weather is a global phenomena, so we have to look at it globally. Now, a lot of it is based on mimicry. We're mimicking the actual, uh, the 
actual atmosphere. And so we have future cast is what it's called, the, the actual what the weather is doing now. And it just projects it out for one second. And that's pretty easy to do. All of us could probably think, okay, this is what is happening now. I throw this up, in one second it will probably be coming down. But then you look at that based on thousands of different points of view and extend it one second further, one second further, one second further. And we'll do that for 10 days with pretty astonishing accuracy. So take one second, one second, one second over millions of different perspectives, really billions of different perspectives, using mathematical calculations for 10 days. And they can run that in a matter of minutes, which is awesome. Uh, the way that they test the models, they actually have computer nerds that program out the models. And the way that they tell if the model's good, they actually run it against historical weather data and say, okay, run your model for uh, 40 years. So you'll run it for 40 years of past weather and see how accurately your model predicts what actually happened during that 40 year span. And they can do that for the entire world. That just makes my face hurt thinking about it. Now what it actually does is it actually generates tools that can be used by meteorologists called prognostic charts. Think medicine, think prognosis, so telling what's going to happen in the future. So we use future cast to give us prog charts. And then a lot of it will also be released as TTS, as text-to-speech, which if the speakers are loud enough will sound like this. The temperature is 88 degrees. Relative humidity is 61%. Yeah, that's where a computer it's reads at you. It sounds about degrees. like this. It's boring. These are that's enough of that. All right, so here's some examples of some prog charts. This one is fairly current prog chart uh, for, well, for when I take it. And so you look at it, it's giving you the surface analysis, and it's actually showing you this is, this is probably time zero. All right, then it'll give you the 12-hour prog chart. This is going to be 12 hours from then. And it can also give you an additional 24-hour uh, prog chart, which is really fun. So let's talk statistics. Statistical calculations. These are the really good ones. Uh, these are the ones that take a blending of the models and everything else. And there's going to be some more links to some more models in the description, by the way. They're the school-friendly kind. All right, so we can use the analog method. It basically looks at what's happening now, what's happening then, and it should be everything should be running parallel. Think about what's been happening in the past. There's the persistence method. Uh, this is basically the idea of what the weather is doing right now. It's going to be doing tomorrow, and it's going to be doing after right now. So whatever the weather is doing, it's going to persist, uh, sort of, uh, based around the idea that the weather should stay relatively stable. And then there's the trend method, where you basically look at what's happening with the weather and you just say, okay, the weather's here and it's going to be moving over there. So you basically just follow the trends. And we're going to focus a lot in class on the trend method because this really applies a lot of the information that you've been using and learning, thinking about. So again, to do the statistical calculation, you're going to need a synoptic weather map, but you also need statistics. So you basically take those prog charts, you take mathematical models, future cast simulations, you combine them with what the weather's already doing. So you can see, right, ha, it's raining. You look at the fronts, you look at the isobars, and you think, where is that rain most likely going to go? Is it moving off back into the ocean this way? Or is it going to swoop down through land? There's probably some kind of low pressure, so it may or may not be doing swirly cakes. And then, you know, we know that it could be sort of like that. And just go all over the place. So those are some of the things. You can also look at this front here, this front here. Uh, remember, we're in the northern hemisphere, so it's probably going to do some of the cyclonic action, start rotating, rotating, moving, and moving. And so that's sort of the general idea behind uh, the statistical forecasting. You look at what's happening, you apply the knowledge, you base it on what happened previously in the past with the weather, combine that with what the models and the supercomputer tell us, and you can actually get a pretty accurate idea of what the weather's going to do. You might not get exactly, it's going to be 68 degrees, but you should be in the ballpark. As always, since it's flipped class and the blue screen of death has to appear before telling you to Moodle. The Moodling will happen down here. The Moodle, 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 forum, Moodle, video, Moodle. Hey, uh, vote, vote. I'm going to give some points about the voting 
So there hasn't been a whole lot of voting participation. It's about to become an assignment, so be ready to vote. If you have any questions, put them in the forum. Links in the twiddly-doodle down there.